with the NFL adding a 17th game this season, uh, what's one way that that could actually help them in their pursuit of free agent wide receivers in the future? A lot of Ravens fans are sold on the prospect of Rashad Bateman joining Baltimore. But if he isn't there, pick number 27. What other wide receiver options should the Ravens go in the first round? What area do you want to see Lamar Jackson and this offense improve in from last year the most? These questions and more on this episode of NFL Questions from Subscribers. Don't get mad. Uh -huh. It's just what it is. What it is. Yeah, we talking sports shot out in Graven Vance. Yeah, this feels like a dream. YouTube team, keep it clean. What's going on? It's Ingraven Graven here with another video and another episode of NFL questions from subscribers. Uh, what well, question from subscribers is it's a series where you can ask me any NFL question you want to based off of any NFL team and we answer it in a video just like this. Now, if you want the chance to be a part of NFL questions from subscribers, then you can send me an email to teamkeepitclean at gmail.com. Don't send it to any other emails or else we won't have your question. Now, this is a special episode of Question from Subscribers because we have a special we are guest today by Chibs, aka Late Round Corner, aka Mike. Uh, go ahead and t tell the people about yourself. Let them know where they can find you and, and exactly what it is that you do. Uh, well, that's a uh, <laughs> lot of stuff, honestly. Uh, so, most of my, uh, I do a lot of draft stuff. Uh, you know that draft season is probably my favorite time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, and all of my draft stuff right now is on nfldraftright.com. Uh, there's also a website that I started, but I've kind of stepped away from for now. Uh, it's called Neutral Zone Infraction, and that's just neutralzoneinfraction.com. But if you want to find any of my stuff, anything that I do is always on my Twitter, um, and it's at Late Round Corner, spelled just like it sounds. Um, apparently, there's a guy named JJ Zachariah that's Late Round QB. Don't get him mixed up. I'm the other guy. Uh, so. That's where that is right now. Uh, I'm working on a couple other things where I might be contributing to Ravens Brawl, uh, but nothing is set in stone there yet. Um, so the best thing I can do is if you like what you hear today, or if you just want to argue, which I, I do like arguing, uh, you can just find me on Twitter at Lay Round Corner. Uh, it's full of opinions and blue collar analysis. I try to keep it simple for like the casual fan. Mm -hmm. um because i know when i first started watching football trying to learn everything was it was overwhelming but what what made you get into really like analyzing and, and no what made you really get into loving the draft man i'd have to say like so i used to be on facebook and i'm not anymore uh and i used to just yeah <laughs> that's what i hear mm -hmm. um i i used to just like watch college prospects when they would come out mm -hmm. and I would say things about them and then people started coming to me and asking my opinion on certain prospects and things like that. And it just kind of grew from there, which is really how like all of my blue collar analysis started was uh, the first site I ever wrote for. I mean, they just picked me up out of a, a Facebook AFC North group oh. um, and it just kind of exploded from there or, you know, grew from there. I don't know that it's exploded yet, but uh, it's really just, you know, people have this tendency to want new and shiny and the next best thing and everything like that. And being able to help them see the pros and cons of each prospect, even if they don't accept it, you know, if they're diehard on a prospect, like, wow, I don't know, Hakeem Butler, um, then they're not going to look away from that prospect, no matter what you say. But uh, it provides the opportunity for people to learn. And I do enjoy helping people get to know the game better mm -hmm. um, and hopefully keep them from, being engaged in silly conversations that they don't need to be a part of. <laughs> okay. All right. And one last question before we get into this. Why Iron Man? Why is he the best Avenger? <sighs> so this is going to be deep, man. Mm -hmm. um, when I grew up, I had a plan for life. And without getting too deep into it, my plan for life ended up getting derailed. And I fell into alcoholism uh, and you know, since then I still drink, obviously everybody knows that I love my bourbon. Um, but I, I'm definitely reformed from how I was and you know me, uh, I've always got a snarky comment to make or a little bit of wit. Um, and I just identified with, uh, Tony Stark stories, like not having his parents growing up and, uh, you know, the alcoholism and the wit and everything like that. Not so much, obviously, the being rich thing, because that would be nice, but it's obviously not on the cards for me. Um, 
And obviously I don't fly around in a metal suit, but that would be also very cool. But I also like, if we're talking just MCU, like if you watch his story arc from how he started to making the ultimate sacrifice for the people that he cared about and people that he didn't even know. I mean, I think there's something within that story versus a guy like, I don't know, Captain America who just decided to give up on his team and go live the life that he wanted to live. Hmm. I appreciate that backstory, man, because I, I didn't even know all that about your love for uh i know you love iron man but i didn't know exactly why so i appreciate you sharing that with us yeah he was like a childhood hero man like comics everything growing up it was it was always iron man so all right cool appreciate it all right so without further ado we got some good questions as we always do let's do it first question came from my guy young gorilla he said what's up engraving hope all is well with you and the fam been watching for a long time and i'm a long time ravens fan since basically harbaugh's third season as head coach so basically i've only had harbaugh as a head coach so with these most likely being his last two seasons in baltimore who do you think the ravens will go after as a new head coach and he has some more questions but we'll, we'll start there first now um I'll start. I, I can't say that these are Harbaugh's last two seasons with the Ravens. I think it depends on a lot that goes on moving forward and, and the success or lack of success. Hopefully it's not lack of success, but it all depends on the Ravens success moving forward. So I can't pencil these in as, OK, after these next two seasons, Harbaugh's done because just right. it, it depends on so much. How, how you feel about that? I don't know. I mean, I do know, uh, again, the new and shiny thing comes into play. For the last couple of seasons, fans have been all out on Harbaugh, um, largely 2019 being the outlier, of course, um, you know, saying Lamar Jackson saved his job and that Harbaugh wasn't a good coach. And like every coach has their faults, period. You're not going to find a coach that is good at absolutely everything. Bill Belichick, maybe the best coach of our generation, probably the best coach of our generation, is terrible at drafting. Like you're not going to find a coach that is perfect at everything. And I don't understand the fans, um, you know, want on abandonment of John Harbaugh. I don't know that he only has two years left. Um, like you said, I think it depends on a lot of things. You know, if they win a Super Bowl in the next two years, John Harbaugh is not going anywhere. Right. If they get close to a Super Bowl, John Harbaugh is not going anywhere. <laughs> um, you know, if everything falls apart, obviously John Harbaugh is probably gone. And then I think you look at a guy – and this is hard to call two years out because you don't know who's going to be available. But if there's right. a guy like uh, Eric B available, I think you take a long, hard look at him. Um, but honestly, I think you pull somebody from the college tracks, like a Lincoln Riley or something like that. Okay. Uh, especially if they're going to extend Lamar Jackson and you have that kind of quarterback um, under your uh, control for the next uh, five, six years, mm -hmm. then I think a college coach is probably going to be able to get the most out of him as far as creativity and, and doing some of the things that Lamar Jackson can do best. I like that. And, and one of the answers that you gave actually led into his next part of the question. And he said, but you answered it already. He said, should Harbaugh stay if we win a Super Bowl in the next two seasons? Of course. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Especially if they don't have a serious upgrade at wide receiver. If they win a Super Bowl with Sammy Watkins as wide out one, then John Harbaugh needs to stay because that is just – it's an <laughs> atrocious wide out group. So, so then he, next up he said, does Wink or Roman get the promotion? Ooh. I, I, I don't think they would give it to Roman. Um, uh, and he, he said, I, I know yeah. it's early, but it's been on my mind since this offseason started. I hope you get to my question. Much love for the channel and for the Keep It Clean family. Have a blessed day. So here's the thing, Gorilla. I, I can appreciate thinking about the future, but thinking about a head coaching change two years in advance seems a little bit arbitrary, man. We have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, super, super, super early. But we appreciate the question, young Gorilla. Next question came from my boy, William J. He said, what's up, Engraven? How are you, bro? I'm just going to get to it because I think this is an issue that is haunting the Ravens and maybe keeping the Ravens from making that splash deal. Of course, we all know Ravens don't make big moves unless it's a cost conscious move. But maybe Eric DeCosta's hands are cuffed just a little because of that infamous Earl Thomas 10 mil uh, dead money. Wonder what moves would be made if the Ravens didn't have the cesspool contract looming over their heads. Anyway, that's my question. Let me know what you think about that. And as always, stay safe. Uh, love you, bro. Love you too, William. Um, so 
<laughs> Go ahead. Do your thing. Man. I would have to hop on Twitter to verify this, but Brian McFarland mm-hmm. uh, at Raven Salary Cap said something about that contract. That they would mm-hmm. have had to not sign Earl Thomas at all for them not to have this money hanging over their head. Now, mm-hmm. granted, the grievance is still going on, but I don't think Earl Thomas is going to win, and I don't know enough about the salary cap to um, – speak on how that affects their their cap but mm-hmm. if you look at it from a objective standpoint they had enough money to make a decent move the question is like how much money are you going to spend for a guy like say Kenny Galladay like if his asking price is 18 million a year which it was are you willing to spend 18 million a year for a guy like Kenny Galladay that's true. So there's, I think there's more to it than just the Earl Thomas contract. I think the Ravens have always been about right player, right price. And I know a lot of fans are like, well, sometimes you have to go get your guy. Mm-hmm. Your guy wasn't there. Allen Robinson got tagged. He was the guy. Chris Godwin mm-hmm. got tagged. He was the other guy. <laughs> Kenny Galladay is a tier below that. So if Kenny Galladay is who he's referencing, I would hesitate on – throwing something at Eric DaCosta because he didn't sign him. Yeah, and um, I, I know, yeah, I was looking at uh, Raven salary cap, looking at his tweet as well, and that, because I, I forget a lot of times about the whole, um, the Earl Thomas grievance and that there's a possible, it, it's possible that those guys may have to pay Earl Thomas that money. Um, right. I don't, I don't see it happening, but we won't know till we know until it's official. But that does make sense as to why they would – I mean, normally they, like you say, right player, right play, right price. They move carefully already, but with that Earl Thomas money possibly hanging over their head, maybe they just keeping some to the side as just-in-case money uh, so they don't get caught up. So you actually had a conversation with him – Yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it does look like it still has implications. All right. So, I mean, I guess it was a good question. Uh, I just feel like in the grand scheme of things, that amount of money is not going to make or break them. Maybe this year for for sure where they have the lower salary cap and everything. But overall, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, you know, $5, $10 million is, is really that much of a boon to uh, or a detriment to the Ravens salary situation. Next question came from my guy Rodell. He said, my guy, with the NFL agreeing to add another game to the season, could this help the Ravens in an unforeseen way? I could really be looking way too deep into this, but hear me out. We've had 1,000-yard rushes in recent years. Uh, We haven't had a 1,000-yard receiver since Lamar has been here. Hollywood and Andrews come close every year because they are our top two options when it comes to throwing the ball. But with Greg Roman having help at coaching, the United States telling Baltimore they have to not only get better at throwing, but to throw more. In this extra game, we may finally be able to have a 1,000-yard wide receiver or two. If that happens, of course, free agents may not be afraid to come here as a wide receiver having a 1,000 yards puts them in a certain bracket stat-wise. What do you think? You can go first. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, that, that, that's an interesting way of, of putting it. I, I never thought about it like that. When I think about the 17-game uh, schedule, um, I think about it, uh, a lot of records just getting ready to be demolished, but yeah. it won't hold the same weight as a 16-game schedule if that same record was demolished. So with this, yeah, a Ravens receiver could get over 1,000 yards now, especially with an extra game. Uh, but at the same time, depending on uh, how the Ravens do, hopefully they will be in this case where they have that option. Uh, but the Ravens could be in a position to where they can rest some starters. It's not a normal thing that happens with the Ravens. Like last season, the, the way that the schedule went, that's a lot more normal for the Ravens than it was in 2019 where they were 14-2 and two and they were just coasting. We weren't used to that. But right. it could be where uh, even if a Ravens receiver gets 1,000 yards, yeah, people could look at it like, oh, yeah, oh, that's great. They, get a, they got 1,000-yard receivers now. Now it looks better. But at the same time, people could also look at it on the other end of the spectrum and be like, oh, it took them 17 games for their receiver to get 1,000 yards? Like, what kind of offense is that? Right. At that point, when you're adding the 17th game, I think you start looking at the deeper stats. Like, for one, uh, yards don't mean anything without scores at the end of it. So Mm -hmm. I would rather have a 700-yard receiver that's scoring eight, nine touchdowns 
or, you know, an 800 yard tight end that's scoring 10 touchdowns, then mm-hmm. I would a thousand yard receiver that's scoring five touchdowns. Like, yes, I know you need the yards to get to the touchdowns, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like thousand yard receiver, great. Who cares? Like it's a fantasy football stat to me. Um, mm-hmm. You want to look at the deeper metrics. Uh, what was he averaging per game? Um, did he have really good games and then really bad games? Or was he fairly consistent every single week? Um, what are his, what's his yards per target? Uh, yards per route run? Uh, your receptions? Uh, are you catching the ball more than you're dropping it? What's your drop rate? What's your, uh, what's your touchdown rate? So on and so forth. Yards don't really matter to me. I get everybody loves the flashy numbers and this, that, and the third. And like, oh, we have a 1,000-yard receiver. Kansas City had a thousand yard tight end. Like it got them to the Super Bowl, granted, but what did he do when he was in the Super Bowl? Mm-hmm. Consistency is what's important to me. While I would, you know, I'm not gonna be like, oh, I had a thousand yard receiver, like get him off the team. Um, <laughs> at the same time, like I don't think it's the end all be all, and I'm not sure that it solves the receiver woes in Baltimore. Then you, I mean, it's just a guy that has more stats because there was more games. I think is the the long and short of it is that's the only reason it would happen in Baltimore, and I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. I am one of the few that believes that you can win with a strong run game and a strong defense in the postseason, as long as you can figure out how to call plays correctly. <laughs> Next question. Came from my boy, OMG. He said, hey, Engraven, hope you and your family are doing well. Haven't sent a question from subscribers since last September, so I thought, why not dust the cobwebs off and ask you this? I don't know if you are a mock draft guy, but I have probably done about a couple dozen mock drafts recently, and nine times out of ten, Rashad Bateman gets taken, and this could be a possibility in the actual upcoming draft. I know a lot of Ravens fans want him to be our ideal guy if the Ravens pick wide receiver in the first round. I haven't been a Ravens fan for too long now, but from what I am hearing, the Ravens love to hog to as many draft picks as possible and will most likely not trade up earlier in the first round from their 27th overall pick spot. So to mentally prepare us Ravens fans for the disappointment uh, of on draft night when Rashad Bateman is off the board and Ravens do go for a wide receiver, who would you like as the, ne- the next option? Uh, disregarding if they are a fit for our team or not, I like Terrace Marshall Jr., Kadarius ah, Tony, boy. Amari Rogers, and because of his connection with T. Martin Soli, and Tamori and Terry. Sorry for the long email. I would also like to throw this question out to all of the Team Keep It Clean members and ask them on their opinions down in the comment section below. Uh, keep up the good work. Love your content and work ethic, and stay safe. And hashtag and EDC we trust. So I'm going to let you take this one all day, every day, because I know you are the, 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 the draft guy. So, so that's- if Rashad Bateman isn't there... What's the next best option? None of them. Oh. Terrence Marshall might be a first. Terrace. Terrace Marshall might be a first round pick. Like he's maybe on the edge of it, but he's a move receiver. The Ravens need a guy to play the boundary and only play the boundary and be a possession receiver and be a true edge receiver. Terrace Marshall, like, ooh, he ran a 4.38. LSU's pro day is held on a really fast field. That guy runs, he plays like a 4-4-6 four, four, maybe, which uh, not bad, but not great either. Um, so like Terrace Marshall is a move receiver. You use him for matchups. He's what, like 6'3", 210 pounds. Like he's a guy that you're going to use for, for matchups. Um, you know, you put him in the slot uh, against a nickel cornerback or you get him on a linebacker. You're not necessarily just going to keep him on the outside edge, which granted now you have Sammy Watkins that can do that. And you have Hollywood Brown that can play in the Z. Uh, Amari Rogers is not a first round talent. Um, and everybody likes him just because of his connection to T uh, Martin. But if you like the connection to T Martin, then you can get an X receiver in round four and his name's Josh Palmer and he's really good. Um, who else did he say? Terrace Marshall, Kadarius Amari Tony. Rogers, Kadarius Tony. Also not a first round talent. He's a second round guy, maybe a third round guy. Um, you know, he had some flashy highlights at Florida, but he's not better than. He's definitely not better than Bateman. I don't even think he's better than Terrace Marshall. Um, I don't think there is a next best option for round one. It, mm. If Rashad Bateman is gone, I mean, unless. If something crazy happens and Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddle, or Jamar Chase are available, 
But Rashad Bateman's gone, then sure, take one of them. But if we're talking like the first four being some order of Smith, Waddle, Chase, and Bateman, there's nobody after that for the first yeah. round. There isn't one. You either trade back or you take best player available, which would be like a Trevon Morig or, uh, you know, like a Aziz Ojolari, Jalen right. Phillips, something like that. Aziz, there's an Aziz Prospect Focus article coming out today. All right, next question came from my guy, Enonic. He said, Engraven, I just finished watching your latest vid. Well, latest vid at the time because he sent this on March 28th. He said, the video about do we bring in Antonio Brown after signing Sammy Watkins. And the Lamar and Hollywood South Florida connection came up because, you know, I love it. Uh, we know Flacco hung out with Todd Heap, then Dennis Pitta, and maybe a few others when he was here. However, Joe did what a QB should do, and that's target a guy down the field. Uh, look, I've got no proof that Flacco didn't hang out with Anquan Bolden, Torrey Smith, Steve Smith Sr., Derek Mason, Jacoby Jones, or Ray Rice. But Joe didn't need to have a guy as part of his crew to throw him a pass. My question for you is, do you think the need for a tight off-the-field connection is a problem for Lamar and the Ravens, the Ravens passing offense moving forward? Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Congrats on 40K. Appreciate it. Uh, you should be proud of the community and culture that you foster. Keep up the great work. Appreciate that, uh, Enonic. Um, That's true. I will. Um, yeah, I, I'll start this one. I, I, I don't think it's a. Uh, you said, do you think the need for a tight off the field connection is a problem for Lamar in the Ravens passing game moving forward? I don't think it should be. I don't. I can't say that it is. Um, I know one of the biggest things that we look at uh, when it comes to the passing game um, is is Miles Boykin. Or the, the 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 lack of targets that he gets, the lack of connection that he has with Lamar Jackson, those two are just they just not on the same page like ever. Right. Um with Miles Boykin, I uh they you don't see any videos of them hanging out or anything like that. You don't see any videos of them off the field or anything like that. But I think one of the reasons why their connection is so bad is because I just don't think there's trust there. Lamar just d- does not look like he trusts Miles Boykin. And I think it's come from when Miles Boykin is targeted, there it, it just something always not always, but enough times something has happened to where things go like terribly wrong. And then I think Lamar has seen enough of that to where he's like, uh, he doesn't he doesn't even look for Miles Boykin half the time. And there could be times when Miles Boykin is wide open, but Lamar won't even be looking his way because I don't think he has trust for him. Now, uh, with Mark Andrews, who's on the opposite end of that spectrum, I don't ever see any videos of them hanging out together, and they have a great connection. Uh, right. he, from jump, from when Lamar came on the scene, him and Mark Andrews, they've had that connection from jump. So I can't say that it's a, uh, a, a lack of off the field connection that would hinder Lamar from really co- connecting with his wide receivers. Uh, but I think it all just depends on who, um, it all depends on, uh, Lamar seeing the field a little bit better. Uh, it, it depends on, um, the offense using guys to their strengths and really putting guys in positions to where they can succeed. Uh, and it all depends on those guys too. Their, their work ethic as well, the route running, if they can get some separation, uh, it's, it's just a mix of things, but I don't think it has anything to do with the off field connection. So, you know what the wild thing about Miles Boykin is? What? So from charting his games, uh, the number of their percentage of catchable targets he had was about 67% of his targets were catchable. Okay, that's not a great number. He caught about 58% of those catchable targets. Also not a great number. But that makes his true catch rate, like if it was adjusted, close to 86, 87%. So like Miles Boykin has the talent. I don't know what the disconnect is there. Mm -hmm. Um, But he has the talent. And it's so frustrating to watch because you're right. There are times that he's wide open. Lamar Jackson doesn't even look at him. Um, and that part's on Lamar, uh, completely on Lamar, because it doesn't matter what has happened the past before. You need to show your guys that you have faith in them and toss them the rock. Um, I don't think having an off the field connection should be part of your game. If yeah. you don't trust the guy because he's causing interceptions like Rashad Perriman, fine. Hey, hey, hey. If you <laughs> I had to get that in there. <laughs> if you don't trust the guy because he has a crucial drop in a game against Tennessee, like Seth Roberts, fine. Oof. But you can't not trust your wide receiver because you don't hang out with him and you don't ride around in the car with him. So if that is part of the problem, 
that is a huge problem, but that's on Lamar's shoulders. It's not on Baltimore's shoulders. The end statement there is that it should not play into who you are throwing the ball to. Right. You need to get everyone involved. Otherwise, you are stimming the offense and you are causing a huge problem as the main guy on the offense. Next question came from my boy, Akil. He said, what's up, Engraven? I've been watching for a while. Appreciate it. He said, and at the present, I need to become a Patreon. I, I ain't no pressure, man. If you want to, that's fine. If you don't want to, that's still fine. Don't, don't pressure. There's pressure. Do it. There's pressure. Get his no. Patreon. <laughs> do it. <laughs> he said, but do you think the Ravens should take a chance on right tackle Isaiah Wilson? He's going through a hard time in his career, and this gives me Darren Waller vibes. I don't know the details, but I feel like we could have held on to him. Uh, I feel like we should not make this mistake again and pick him up for cheap and give him some time to better himself. So Akil said he wants the Ravens to bring in Isaiah Wilson. Um, and this would, I mean, assuming that Orlando Brown Jr. would be traded. I, um, you could do that, but you can't put all your eggs in the Isaiah Wilson basket. Yeah, you can't like you bank on him to be there. like, all right. <laughs> so you can't bank on him to be like, okay, this is our guy at tackle. This is who we're moving forward with because you saw what happened with the Titans. You saw what happened with the Dolphins. You can't bring him on and expect your team to be like this savior team and like, oh yeah, okay, we revived this career. We're gonna revive his career. It's no doubt that we're gonna get this thing done, and he is going to be our guy. You could, <sighs> I, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, no, you can't do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm all the way out on that. First of all, uh, a person has to want the help for them to accept the help. Isaiah Wilson is not at that stage of his life. Uh, there is a lot about him that makes me think he just wanted that rookie contract so he could just live out his days and do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. Like He's out here dancing on cars and breaking car windows and like doing all types of crazy stuff. Like I get it. I get the, the upside because of the talent and everything right. like that. But one, you don't want to take the shot. And two, you risk bringing a cancer into the team. And you cannot afford that when you're in the middle of your, your Super Bowl window. I would rather take a shot on a guy that has, uh, you know, that's coming off injury, like Mitchell Schwartz or something like that. Or, I don't know, maybe draft one in a historically deep draft because offensive tackle is pretty deep. Interior offensive line is ridiculously deep. Mm. So if you, and the Ravens are pretty good at drafting offensive linemen. So right. if you're going to take the shot, you take the shot in the draft or you take the shot with a proven vet like Mitchell Schwartz or something like that. Um, or I, I don't know, maybe keep Orlando Brown who wasn't top 10 in pass block win rate or run block win rate in 2020 at left tackle let's face facts orlando brown is a right tackle period he played well <laughs> at left tackle he's not in the top 10 category maybe he just i understand it's his dad's dream for him and everything like that but at some point dude like you're gonna make more money playing right tackle over the course of a career anyway and right tackle is just as important as left tackle these days because defenses are moving their pass rushers around all the time mm. That's so right now we have Orlando Brown until we don't have Orlando Brown. Next question came from my guy, Adit. He said, uh, my first name sounds like how it's spelled. Uh, but anyway, got you. He said, hey, Engraven, long time subscriber, first time asking a question. What area do you want to see the offense improving the most from last year? For me, it's third down, fourth down, and red zone efficiency. In 2019, we were the most efficient offense, but... We lack the talent to go to the championship game. This year, with the new coaches and Watkins signing, I feel like we have more talent in the wide receiver room than in 2019. If we can use what we have currently on the roster and return to the efficiency that we had two years ago, I think that we could go further. I apologize if this is a long question. Just wanted to hear your thoughts. So, from Ravens this offense, what, what is the biggest improvement you want to see from the Ravens offense moving forward? Well, right off the bat, I don't think you need to see a huge improvement in third and fourth down because if the Ravens' offense improves, you won't be in a lot of fourth down situations. <laughs> um, so, 
asking for them to improve in third and fourth down. Like, yeah, I get it. it yes, I would like to see them improve there too if they're in those scenarios. Mm-hmm. But the biggest thing I would like to see them improve in would just be, and this is kind of a cop out, but just kind of in general, mm-hmm. play calling needs to be better. Uh, concentration drops need to go down. Um, yards of separation needs to go up. The average yards of separation for anybody not named Willie Sneed uh, was abysmal. Willie Sneed, by the way, was what they call wide open on 47% of his routes run. 47. Only guy. That's the guy we let walk to the Raiders. Hollywood Brown, I think, had uh, 1.7 average yards of separation. Mark Andrews had 2.1. Miles Boykin actually had more. He had 2.3. Um, so separation routes are something that I would like to see work on. Uh, I think Sammy Watkins will kind of help with that as far as, uh, taking attention and opening up separation and whatnot. Uh, mm-hmm. especially as if he slotted in as the, the quote unquote wide out one. Um, I think that kind of opens up Marquise a little bit and everything like that. So that helps. Um, so I think route running is honestly going to show a bigger improvement than people think it will. Uh, to the overall offense. So I think that's the biggest thing that I would like to see, especially out of like T Martin, like right. teach these kids how to run routes. So they're not getting their legs tangled with the DB every time they make a break. Um, yeah. So I didn't think about that until right now, but I guess route separation would probably be the biggest thing for me because you start doing that and everything else improves. Okay. Oh, and come on with the illegal formations. Yes. that see, man. I was like, okay, I'm surprised he didn't say my answer yet. But that that was mine was be the uh the pre-snap penalties. It was like there was a point in where we reached where we, we just expected it every single game and we knew they had to get at least like two out of their system every single game with the pre-snap. It was like a nine game streak. It was ridiculous. Yeah, man. It it was bad. But so that that would be one of my biggest improvements. Another one for me would be the consistency of the deep ball. Uh, there were a lot of opportunities that were missed with the deep ball. Um, and there will be times where there's a lot of times with Hollywood. That's why I say Hollywood should have had a lot more yards than he did have because there would be times when Hollywood, he would blow past the defender and Lamar would either over or under throw it. Um, and I would also say with Lamar, the, uh, the, the quick decision making and not necessarily yep. be, to be locked on to one wide receiver, but to make quick decisions and really be sure of himself. Uh, one of the examples of where one of the biggest examples from last year for me, where I saw that Lamar was unsure of himself, uh, was in the game against the, the Jaguars, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Ravens came out; they were moving the ball down the field on the first drive of, of the uh, of the game for them, first offensive drive, moving the ball down the field, and it gets to the point where Lamar he drops back. Hollywood he's behind the uh, the defenders in the end zone. There's two defenders on him; he's behind both of them. If Lamar throws it, boom, it's touchdown but he hesitated a bit and still hesitated a bit. And then he threw it interception. Yeah. So it's um, Lamar overall, he's a very good decision maker, but it's, it's some of those decisions where it's like, you, you really got, you got to trust your arm. So right. I would say that, and also um, taking a bit, a bit more of the check downs too. Cause I know a lot of times with Lamar, he's, he's goes for that big hero play that Superman play that big play. Um, but there may be a check down that's available right there. And, you know, Lamar, he wants to move the ball down the field. Of course, any quarterback does, but sometimes you got to just take what those uh, defenses give you. And I think that uh, Lamar should do a better job uh, of doing that. Um, and I would say for as far as the offense, too, as a whole, I mean, this is more so a coaching. Of course, you know, Lamar, you know, he can do everything. He can do all the stuff. He can pass. He can run all that. But I would love to see where – because we definitely uh, use all of Lamar's talent. We use it, obviously use his arm, not, not as much as they should, but they use his legs a lot. I would like to see to where we really do that same thing, where we try to maximize using players' talents with other guys. Yeah. So with, a, and especially guys like a Devin DuVernay, they, they do it with Hollywood. They definitely use him and Andrews, but, and they, they do it with the running backs too. But with the wide receivers, I would really, really, really love to see those guys like Devin DuVernay and, and Sammy Watkins and then even Pro Sh- Boykin too, just see those guys. And I know it's only so many balls to go around, but I would love to see to where those guys' talents really get maximized as much as they possibly can. 
And when you're talking about a guy like Duvernay, like he should have been used more last season and he wasn't. So I agree with you there. The thing about the checkdowns, um, Gus Edwards has really improved. His hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my knocks on J.K. Dobbins coming out of college was he needed to improve his hands. So, yeah. 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 Uh, so I agree. Sometimes you need to take what the defense gives you. The other part of that is – I'm not sure that their hands are there yet. Uh, mm-hmm. Gus, Gus more so than JK for sure. And Patrick Ricard needs to work on his hands as well. You need to have that option. Um, you also need to have a good underneath guy. Hopefully mm-hmm. Devin Duvernay is going to be that guy this year. Um, but it needs to be there and you need to be sure of it, which goes back to what you said originally uh, about Lamar Jackson feeling sure of himself. You also need to be sure of your guy. Oh, yeah, I liked it. Next question came from my guy, uh, Doc Zenith. He said, what's up? Love the channel. Appreciate it, man. He said, what do you think about Orlando Brown, trading Orlando Brown Jr. to the Dolphins uh, for their pick if Kyle Pitts is available? Um, I, I do not see I – do, I don't envision any scenario where uh, a Dolphins, one of their first-round picks – uh, I don't envision any scenario where they would trade for Orlando Brown Jr. with one of those really, really high first round draft picks. I mean, I wouldn't be mad if they did, but I, I don't see that happening. And then the, the Ravens taking Kyle Pitts. Now that that would ooh, that would be something right there, man. Ooh. Kyle Sign Pitts, and, yeah, that would be sick. <laughs> but I just, I, <laughs> I just don't see it happening, man. It's inconceivable. Kyle Pitts is gone by pick four. Mm-hmm. The, the Falcons have had like 12 Zoom meetings with him at this point. Like, <laughs> it's probably the safest pick in the draft outside of Trevor Lawrence at one. Like if you're mocking, it's Trevor Lawrence at one, Zach Wilson at two, I don't know at three, Kyle Pitts at four. Mm. <laughs> Next question came from my boy Dre from Hawaii. He said, I want you to look at some film on my brother and please let me know what you think. I really will be happy if we drafted him. He would be a steal. I think we will bring back LJ for it too. What do you think? Um, and his brother that he's talking about is from Arkansas State, uh, Jonathan Adams. What do you think about Jonathan Adams? Okay. Um, actually, I have some notes here. Oh, perfect. And while he's looking up those notes about bringing LJ Ford back, I love the idea of bringing LJ Ford back, but also, mm-hmm. like, you have to understand that the young guys need to get their reps. And they are, they're pretty happy with how Chris Board has come on. Mm-hmm. So you have to let, and I love how Malik Harrison um, had, came on last year. A lot of people, I think, are underrating what he's going to be. Um, Patrick Queen had a lot to work on. Malik Harrison is very good at the role that he is being asked to do. He was on my list of X receivers. Um, I feel like he has an attitude problem, which I absolutely love. Not that he has an attitude problem, but that he plays with an attitude problem. And I absolutely love that. If you have an ex receiver, you want them to have that mean streak and just kind of like get out there and punch guys in the mouth uh, to go and get the ball. But I also think that like, he's also a downfield threat. So it's a weird paradigm because he has this attitude and he can go up and he can high point the ball um, and he wins his contested catches, but you can also get him down the field. So I think that's a nice combination of like size, speed, strength. Um, mm-hmm. I do think that he has issues. He's got a few issues as far as uh, route running. Um, he wasn't asked to do a lot of Arkansas State. Um, I've seen him run three different routes. Uh, you need to run the entire tree as an X receiver in the, the NFL. Uh, I also think that he has some issues with uh, concentration drops. I don't think they're that blatant, um, but I know he definitely has some. So mm-hmm. if he works on his hands, uh, route running is going to be a big thing. His releases need work as far as foot and hand work. Um, but if he fixes that stuff, I mean, I think he's going to be very good. Uh, he offers a little bit on special teams, um, but I don't think he's particularly – twitchy enough to be a good special teams wide receiver which is fine if if you're taking a guy to be your ex receiver you don't necessarily want yeah, him on special teams yeah. anyway. so um i mean i don't hate it uh, i think he's probably a late day two early day three guy i mean the fact that he had over 1100 yards uh in he played in less than 10 games because he was out for a couple of quarters 
he's definitely got the stats to back it up. I know you don't get a whole bunch of uh, you don't get a whole bunch of eyes on yet Arkansas State, but I did like Adams. Uh, he's probably in my top seventeen X receivers. Okay, which is pretty good considering how deep that sounds like not great. Um, but considering how deep this wide receiver class is, top seventeen is actually pretty good. Okay, but do you think we'll eventually trade? Orlando Brown Jr. for draft capital or for DJ Shark or Michael Thomas. Uh, EDC has something up his sleeve. Hashtag silent assassins. I uh, hope you and your family are great and I enjoy the content. Go Ravens and Lamar Jackson will win MVP this year. Appreciate it, Jay. Um, for Shark, I don't think Shark happens. I would, wouldn't mind, but I, I don't think Shark happens. I know Tony Khan got into it on Twitter with that, uh, the guy, CJ Golson. Uh, yeah. And yeah, he kept shutting that down. But at the same time, I was thinking, like, hold up. Why is Tony Khan continuously going at this random guy? And I was thinking, man, like, why even waste the energy going at this random person that said that this trade was in the works? And it just it just had me thinking a bit, like, does that mean that it actually might have been ripped? But anyway, um, and Michael Thomas, I uh, I don't think that one happens either. Uh, I know Saints are doing a lot of um, – they, they've been trying to get under – the well, they're obviously under salary cap now, but they've been trying to get a lot of additional cap space. But yeah. I don't think Michael Thomas is, um, is going to be uh, traded now. Last year, if you would ask me that, I did think that he could have been traded last year, but this year, no, I don't, I don't see it happening. Um, but as – as far as Orlando Brown Jr., I said this in a video, uh, I think, from yesterday, or when you're seeing this video, maybe from a couple of days ago. But I, if Orlando Brown Jr. doesn't get oh, traded uh, before the draft, or if he doesn't get traded on the first night of the draft, then I don't think he's going anywhere. And I think Not that every single that year that passes, uh, Orlando Brown Jr. has a higher and higher chance of staying uh, a Baltimore Raven. Yeah, I that's I said that as well. And the whole uh, OBJ for Shark thing didn't really make sense to me because if you're getting Trevor Lawrence, right, and you have all this cap space and you're trying to build something, you have all this draft capital and you're trying to build something in Jacksonville, mm -hmm. why would you get rid of your number one wide receiver? Because you're automatically hamstringing uh, Trevor Lawrence at that point. Yeah. And, and people just want to be like, well, Right. And people were like, oh, well, they can just get another one in the draft. Dude, the hit rate on a guy like DJ Shark in the draft mm. is not great. So it makes no logistical sense for the Jaguars to trade for Orlando Brown when they can they have enough picks where they can just draft an offensive tackle. And if they don't feel great about that one, draft another one. So there's no reason <laughs> for them to to trade for a guy that's gonna get a market level contract at LT. It just doesn't make mm. sense. Um, I agree with you that each day that passes, Orlando Brown is more than likely going to stay uh, a Baltimore Raven. That is not to say that he won't be traded at deadline. Mm. Um, but again, doesn't make sense for the Ravens to trade Orlando Brown. They have all the leverage, first of all. Second of all, they are right smack in the middle of a Super Bowl window. Mm. You don't... <laughs> You have Ronnie Stanley on one side and Orlando Brown on the other. Like that's a really good situation to be in. You don't just trade that away because oh, I'm getting a second round pick for it. No, you're gonna give me a couple of firsts, uh, maybe a player that I want. Mm -hmm. If you think this is a market level left tackle, that's what the going rate is. Period. I mean, look what. Now, granted, it was Bill O'Brien, so this was a little bit of an overpay. <laughs> but look at what, what Laramie Tunsil got when he got traded to Houston. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, the Dolphins are still building their team off of that. Yeah. So if um, it's not that kind of package or something close to it, sorry, bud, you're at right tackle. I don't know what to tell you. Plus, somebody brought up this point, like, what if Ronnie Stanley's not ready for week one? That's true. Are you comfortable with, like, Tyree Phillips? And uh, I don't even know who would be on the other side at that point. If OBJ is gone and Ronnie Stanley's still injured, then you have Tyree Phillips and, what, DJ Fluker? Ben Bredesen? Like, who's playing tackle at that point? You can't hamstring yourself – by getting rid of OBJ just to make him happy. He doesn't have the leverage. He, mm. I hate to put it this way, but he can just sit and chill until something happens. Worst case scenario, he leaves in free agency next year. Mm. 
See, that's that's something that I didn't think about um, would be if if they got rid of Orlando Brown Jr. and Ronnie Stanley still wasn't ready to come back yet. Right. Uh, that that Yeah, that, that's scary to think about. Yeah, then you're going to crush your franchise quarterback. If he gets injured, then your whole season's a waste and goodbye Super Bowl window. And last question on this episode, a question from subscribers came from Tanja. She said, hey, good morning, Graven. Hope you and the family are great. I was at work and watching First Thing First, and they talked about Sammy Watkins being injury prone and how he might not be reliable for Lamar Jackson. I feel a little better about Sammy being a Raven because the analyst mentioned that Sammy tweeted, this is going to be a season to remember. So to me, it seems like he is all in. Plus, the analysis said that we still need another receiver because we can't rely on Sammy Watkins. I agree. Uh, and guess who they said we need to get? Antonio Brown. Could it happen? I will be done. Maybe it's just a dream. Have a great day. Your friend. Tanja. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I said as, as soon as they signed Sammy Watkins. Even I remember the video that we did when it came out that the Ravens were even interested in Sammy Watkins. I said, if they sign him, I feel like that can't be it, man, because he hasn't played a full season since 2014, his rookie year. Rookie season, yeah. And you, you just – you love the up. You, I'm, I, I like the upgrade and, and hope that it works out. And I mean, I, I can't really. Um, I know he did say that he was all in and that he was tweeting all this stuff about the Ravens, but that's a team that gave him his opportunity. Had he went to another team, he would have been tweeting all the same stuff. Correct. Um, but I am, I'm hopeful for what he can do, and I, I hope that he can stay healthy. It's gonna be that much harder now, especially because they added a 17th game. So it's like, oh man. But um, with Sammy Watkins, I. It's just a lot of hope. Uh, my expectations, not that they're low or anything, but my expectations, they're, they're tempered. Um, I don't expect him to come in and just all oh, go off and just explode, and da, 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 but I do expect him to be a, a significant contributor to the right. offense, especially since it's an offense that he uh, should be able to pick up on quickly since he ran it before some years back. Um, but with, with him, I just – I don't feel like this should be it. Like, the Ravens should be like, okay, we're done. That's it. We're yeah. finished. I feel like they should still invest in another, whether it's via trade, whether it's via draft, whether, whether – however they get it, I feel like they shouldn't be done. So I completely agree with you because as soon as they sign Sammy, like I tweeted out right afterwards, like the Ravens still need a true X receiver. And they do, whether it's through the draft or a trade or, or whatever. I mean, you want to trade Orlando Brown over to, uh, to Chicago? Give us Allen Robinson. Cool with that. Uh, you want to draft Rashad Bateman? Cool with that too. Josh Palmer, Nico Collins. Absolutely. Let's get it. Sammy is not an X receiver. Um, even if he does stay healthy for the entire season, um, they need a bigger, more physical imposing presence uh, to take attention off of whoever is on the field at, at the time. Plus what people aren't thinking about, what if Sammy stays healthy? But somebody else gets hurt. Mm. What if Marquise, and I'm not trying to put anything out in the world, but he's fast, dude. Fast people tend to have leg injuries, uh, you know, if they don't properly take care of themselves. And on top of it, he's little. So what if something happens to his leg? He's got a sprain for a few weeks. Mm. Who do you have then? Then you have Sammy as your fast guy. And what, Miles Boykin, Devin Duvernay, James Prochet? Are you comfortable with that? You have to get another guy. Absolutely have to. Um, I don't want to say I have no faith in Sammy, but show me you can stay healthy. Your range of outcomes, more likely he is going to get injured than he isn't going to be injured due to his past history. Now, I don't know that he's injury prone. A lot of the things that have happened to him seem like freak accidents, and there is a huge disparity between freak accident and being injury prone. So uh, I would have to take a deeper look at all his injuries and how they happened and, and kind of come up with a conclusion after that. But I think she's right. You can't have the faith in Sammy to be there for the entire season uh, until he shows that he can.